Hi, Ben Pearson, The Roaster Tracker, and today I'd like to make to you a little bit of a controversial opinion. So hear me out before you start throwing any eggshells or downvoting my videos or unsubscribing or any of that crazy stuff. I think that NASA is justified in the SLS program, both in the past and even in the present today. Okay, hear me out. Now, my viewpoint has actually changed on this a fair bit in recent times. I recently attended the Humans to Mars Summit in Washington, D.C., and there I met with Poppy Price, who is the chief engineer of Mars programs at JPL. And he really helped me to change my perspective. He told me, you know, if NASA had relied on Falcon Heavy for the missions, then where would they have been? We know that Falcon Heavy was vastly delayed. And so while there are these great and exciting things that are coming on, NASA can't necessarily count on them. And so let's start going back in time and going through this. The year is 2011. In the space world, there are a number of different things. The biggest thing that's happening is the space shuttle is retiring, and NASA is trying to figure out what it's going to do in the long-term future. Well, they want to go into deep space exploration, and this has been the goal for at least since 2004, and to a lesser extent for some period of time. The public is really interested in these deep space exploration missions. The space shuttle just didn't capture the imagination of the human public as much as going to the moon would, say. So, they're trying to figure all of this out, and what do they do? Well. The Constellation program was having some issues, the Ares-1 was kind of deemed unsafe, and that was a pretty critical part in that. So they decided to scrap that and to create a new rocket called the SLS rocket. And granted, the U.S. Senate had a fair bit to do with this, and maybe it wasn't entirely fair, but there you go. So SLS is coming as an interesting concept. It would take space shuttle hardware and combine it together in a rocket, and hey, it should be easy, right? You already have the rocket engine, you already have the boosters, just slapping all of these components that exist together should be easy, and it should have been. And I don't understand, personally, why it was so difficult. So if there's anyone who knows why the SLS program was so expensive and has taken so long, please write in the comments below, I'd really like to hear and understand this, and I'm sure it has to do more than just politics or pork barrel spending or anything like that. But you know, let me know. I'm really interested in that. Seriously. The launch providers in 2011 was Orbital, who's been since bought out by Northrop Grubbin. They had a number of rockets. The Pegasus rocket that would launch in an airplane. They had the Minotaur rocket. They had Taurus rocket. A number of these solid rockets that would kind of only serve a small satellite population. And they had the Antares rocket that was being built to carry payloads to the International Space Station. Now, even to this day, nobody has done a dedicated Antares launch that didn't have a mission to the space station. So they haven't really captured that market. And it's these are all pretty small rockets. You had SpaceX, who was a really newcomer into the space. They had a total of seven launch attempts at this point in time, four of which were successful. Two Falcon 1 successful, and two Falcon 9 successful, and three Falcon 1s that had failed. Now, they were an up-and-coming, promising company. They were able to take cargo to the space station only a few years later, but they still weren't quite there. And then you had ULA who their biggest rocket was the Delta Heavy that could carry about 23 metric tons to orbit. And they were kind of fixed in their ways at this point in time, not really developing their own private rocket. So they needed a rocket to do deep space exploration. Now, SpaceX had an interesting concept in this year that they presented of the Falcon Heavy that would combine three cores of Falcon 9 together and do cross-feeding of the fuel in such a way that could carry 55 metric tons to orbit. Now, 55 metric tons seems like a lot, but it's not quite enough to really do anything as far as space exploration goes. And so you have this rocket that doesn't quite suit NASA's purpose, so they go and build their own rocket. 
Okay, so let's fast forward to 2017. At this point in time, SpaceX was a much more interesting company. You had Blue Origin, who has existed longer than SpaceX, actually. They're starting to be a little bit more public. They've started to talk about a couple of rocket systems that might help out with this, but nobody really knows what they're doing. They have the new Shepard rocket that's making some suborbital jumps, but nothing else. You have SpaceX, who's just barely starting to prove the concept of reusable rockets. Blue Origin also was doing so with the new Shepard. Their new Glenn, Blue Origin's new Glenn rocket, was promising to really reduce this cost. But SpaceX, they had announced the Starship mission, which would be able to take a very large amount of payload in space. At this time it was called the Interplanetary Transport Lander. Goal was going to Mars. In order to do that it relied on refueling in low Earth orbit and very quickly and rapidly reusing the rockets, which is something that's quite challenging and unproven. It sounded like an interesting concept. Falcon Heavy still wasn't launched yet. So really only SLS was there. And even with the two closest contenders other than Starship that was out there, they weren't good enough to carry the Orion, which had already been developed and was a pretty good little spacecraft to carry it to the moon for its primary mission. So let's fast forward to today. How does it look today? Well, we still have the same big rocket companies. They're making some progress. SpaceX finally, only five years late, was able to launch a Falcon Heavy. And then more than a year later, they were able to launch the second one. They promised they could launch the second one in three to six months, but it took them over a year. Granted, they had some good reasons why, but still, this is how they were. They were quite delayed. The Starship concept is coming along pretty nicely, but the Starship concept relies on three major events that have not yet been proven. The first one is, is it has to get to orbit. Getting to orbit is difficult, and I have full confidence that SpaceX can do it, and I believe NASA does too. But once you get Starship to orbit, you have 100 tons in low Earth orbit. Starship is really designed to go to carry heavy payloads to other planets, but it relies on two exotic technologies that have not yet been proven. The first one of these is to rapidly reuse the entire rocket. Now, this hasn't been proven yet. The lower stages have been reused by SpaceX for a couple of years now, and they're getting really good at it, and it's pretty normal now. It's actually the exception when one of the SpaceX landers fails. But for Starship to work, you have to get all of them to work. It, in order to send a Starship mission to the moon, you have to launch about seven to eight Starship missions to low Earth orbit and then slowly into higher orbits in order to get all of the fuel there. You can't just have a fully refueled spacecraft in low Earth orbit either. So at an estimated 350 to 400 million dollar cost per Starship, it would be three billion dollars or more to get to the moon with Starship if you do not have reusability. That's more than an SLS theoretically will cost once it's reached its steady state purpose. Now granted you need two SLS missions to get to the moon, but it's the same cost at that point in time. Granted they've also been able to reuse the lower stage booster, and it's pretty sure that they'll be able to do that. But even at that, you might reduce the cost by half at this point in time. You're still having a pretty high cost to be able to get the spacecraft there on the order of one and a half to two billion dollars, unless you can reuse the upper stage. The second key technology I've already mentioned is the refueling. You have to be able to refuel the spacecraft on orbit. And if you can't do that, then you actually cannot really reach the moon. Even a 
flyby of the moon with Starship. It is meant to be fully refueled on orbit, and without that capability, it's pretty much useless as far as interplanetary purposes go. Now, you could carry a huge payload into low Earth orbit, and maybe that payload could be another rocket that could go fire off somewhere, but it's just not quite there. Starship looks great, and trust me, I talked to several engineers at NASA, and they're excited about Starship. They want it to be reality because it will make space exploration amazing. But it's just too early at this point in time. They haven't even gotten to orbit yet, and then they have to still prove out these critical technologies. In my mind, it's once they can demonstrate the refueling capability and the rapid reuse capability that they'll start to be a lot more convinced that they can make a mission to the moon or Mars in the short-term future, and NASA's just not willing to commit until they have some reasonable evidence that that's the case. And that is completely understandable. Secondly, they really would need two commercial providers for them to feel confident. They've always felt more confident with two, and this makes sense. When Orbital had a rocket that blew up practically on the launch pad, and SpaceX was still there that could carry its payloads. And when SpaceX lost a commercial payload on its way up, then Orbital was able to, and they were kind of able to play off of each other. And they're doing the same thing with the commercial crew. They have two different providers. So this will allow them continual access to space, which is critical. Okay, so who else could be the second provider? Well. The biggest name that comes to mind is Blue Origin. Blue Origin just announced the Blue Moon Lander. With the elongated version, they could carry an ascent stage, and this ascent stage could get them into a low lunar orbit. Now, there's still some issues. First of all, they're only in low lunar orbit. They have to then dock with another spacecraft, presumably an Orion space capsule, enter there, and then they can return back to Earth. So that should probably work. But there's still a need for an SLS rocket to carry Orion to the moon. And secondly, we don't really know how Blue Moon is going to get to the moon. They strongly hinted that the new Glenn will be able to do that, but doing the math, it just doesn't quite seem like there's enough fuel for the capacity that they're talking about. There's something that we're not being told yet. And for the elongated version, it would be extremely difficult. Now, they might be able to do multiple launches and get it there. And I'm sure they have something figured out that we just don't know yet. But they still haven't even launched into an orbital mission yet. They've been doing suborbital missions with high reliability. And I think everyone assumes, myself included, that they're going to make it to orbit in the next year or two. But they can't count on it. So... NASA has to keep developing their own system because they have to explore deep space and they cannot just rely on these commercial providers. When the commercial providers are there and when there's multiple of them, then they make the case that SLS is no longer needed. But as of today, as of 2019, it is still needed. And it will be needed until SpaceX and Blue Origin or maybe some other rocket company, ULA or Lockheed Martin or Boeing or whoever else will be able to demonstrate this capability. And so why doesn't NASA push forward some kind of an agenda where that would work? Well, there's a lot of reasons why, but first of all, SpaceX has said that they don't want NASA money directly, so they can't fund it directly. And the reason they don't is because it increases the expense and the difficulty. Look at how much Crew Dragon has cost. It cost about $3 billion. And if SpaceX is developing this on their own, they might be able to do it for 5 or $6 billion for a much more capable rocket. So while they want to have customers that are in the government, NASA and, and others, they don't want to be beholden to them in the development phase of the vehicle, and I can understand that. And 
Blue Origin actually is taking some NASA money to develop a lunar lander. So NASA is doing what they can, and they have stated that when an alternative architecture shows itself, that they are willing to consider this. But as of right now, NASA has to keep going with SLS. And this pains me to say this. There are so many issues. Now, don't get me started about the Gateway. I think the Gateway is a complete waste of money. I think they could do it without it, and it would be a better program without it. But SLS, as it stands, is essential to meeting NASA's goals. And it has to stick around until the commercial space can fully prove the capability. Now, does the SLS need to be used for a mission like Europa Clipper? No. Falcon Heavy should be able to launch Europa Clipper. But as far as human deep space exploration goes, it's really the only vehicle that NASA can rely on to be able to do that as the things go right now. So, okay. You guys can throw your eggshells now. You have your comments. Let me know. Tell me how I'm wrong. I'd really like to understand this better, but as I see things right now, NASA has to keep going until somebody else can prove them wrong. Thank you guys very much for joining me. Let me know whatever questions or comments you guys have. And until next time, keep on tracking. Take care.